I got flowers today. It wasn't our anniversary or any other special day. Last night, he threw me into the wall and started to choke me. It seemed like a nightmare. I couldn't believe it was real. I woke up this morning sore and bruised all over. I know he must be sorry because he sent me flowers today. I got flowers today. It wasn't Mother's Day or any other special day. Last night he beat me up again and it was much worse than the other time. <coughs> if I leave him, what will I do? How will I take care of my kids? What about money? I'm afraid of him and scared to leave. But I know he must be sorry because he sent me flowers today. I got flowers today. <coughs> today was a very special day. It was the day of my funeral. Last night he finally killed me. He beat me to death. If I had only gathered enough courage and strength to leave him, I would not have, I would not have gotten flowers today. This poem is dedicated to the victims and the survivors of domestic violence. You ask, why didn't she leave? I ask, why did he hit her? Domestic violence turns deadly. For the second time in as many days, Cleveland is dealing with a domestic murder. The first yesterday at this Burger King on Cleveland's west side. The second inside this home along Clover side. And it was an elderly couple. One of the things that I could assume about this couple from Burger King's is one of the signals is isolation and control. Isolation and control. And originally, it feels good when you're with someone and they're saying, you know what, when I come home, I don't want you talking on the phone to anybody else because I just want you all to myself. I just want to enjoy you. No, I don't want to go to your family event because we can have our own event and we can establish some things for our family. No, um, who, who, where did you go? Who did you have lunch with? It's all about control. But if you remember and you think, how many have children in here? OK, if you have children and when you're trying to tell your child to do something and they're not listening to you and then you finally start doing what? Raising your voice. Right. And then if they're not still listening to you, depending on what school you came from, what school of thought you came from, if they're still not listening to you, you might reach out and do what? OK, <laughs> touch them. <laughs> exactly. You know. And, and so what we're saying when we do that is I'm losing control. So therefore, I need to regain control. And the way I do that is to reach out and touch you or put my hands on you or domestic violence. I'm Eilinda Reese, and I brought you here because this is a passion for me. I am a survivor and a thriver of domestic violence. And I believe that you're here for the same reason that I'm here, and it is to save lives. You say love doesn't hurt, does it? I've never seen love kick nobody, choke nobody, scratch nobody, belittle nobody, kill nobody. That's not love, honey. So we really have to talk to our teens. And I do all the things that I do simply because I was a victim. I'm a survivor, so a thriver. Yeah, from domestic violence. And it occurred years ago when I lived in California. Mm. I was in a, a very abusive uh, relationship. And of course, yeah, I won't go along in that because it's like four years. I just say Google. <laughs> only that I can tell you. And um, when you try to leave, that's the most yeah. dangerous time. Mm -hmm. And when I was fed up and had enough, 
that he would beat me, he would beat his own children. Oh my gosh, there's so many things he did to us. When I tried to leave with me and my children, he locked us up in a garage for over six months so we could escape. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, where we lived at was a rural part of a Temecula in the mountains, so it's like Amish country, huh? houses far between. Nobody knew we were up there. It was days we ate, days we didn't eat. Mm. It was cold in that garage, like it's cold in this room. <laughs> <laughs> how much you love that person, how much you're dedicated to them, there comes a time where there needs to be a split. And I say that all the time in my court. You know, I know you love each other. I know, you know, there's a history here. But sometimes things just run its course. You know, things don't last forever. And maybe this relationship has run its course. And I tell men, because I try to give them this, this edge, because, again, there a lot of them are never guilty, never. And I said, well, okay, brother, if you're not guilty, whatever's going on in your relationship that causes the police to be involved, you need to reevaluate that relationship. Maybe you don't need to be there. Maybe the two of you don't get along anymore. Maybe it's more than just staying there for the kids if the kids have to witness this. That's another thing. Can you imagine how many times, how many cases I have where there are young people in the house when there's domestic violence? And all you are doing is creating a cycle of violence and acceptance in those young people's minds. The, whoever the offender is, you know, they're, they're teaching the young people that that's how you communicate. You communicate by being physical, by being aggressive. And then the victims, those, those kids, they're, they're learning that, hey, maybe you stay because I love that person. Or they were, they were good to me yesterday or they made me laugh an hour ago or they're hugging me now. So what we're doing is when we have these acts that are being perpetrated right in front of our youth, it gets beyond us. So maybe... Maybe Judge Dawson, maybe I'm crazy. I'm going to sit there and let my wife beat me over the head 28 times and I'm not going to leave. But when my daughter starts watching that or my son starts seeing that, I'm creating a cycle in that young person that they're going to have to deal with years from now. So if I'm still willing to deal with that, I should have at least enough care and concern for my little ones that they don't get into that cycle. Um, during my tenure in the 15 years I've been in the domestic violence unit has um, brought me a lot of joy being able to help women not become victims but become survivors of domestic violence. Um, it also has been some very sad times. Um, during my tenure, we have lost 18 women to domestic violence homicides. Um, and sometimes, just like the judge spoke, sometimes um, when you're in those relationships, it's something that keeps the victim there. You know, whether it's being because this is their child's father, they remember a time when that person was not that way and they feel like they can help this individual or it could be about financial situations. But I want to give you a few facts on pregnancy and domestic violence. Violence, um, violence occur commonly in pregnancy. Between four and eight percent of women experience <laughs> Um, experience domestic violence during their pregnancy. The effect of violence during pregnancy can be devastating to both the mother and the unborn child. Domestic violence during pregnancy links, is linked to depression, substance abuse, smoking, anemia, first and second trimester bleeding, and reduction in birth weight. Unfortunately, and we're working to get this change, um, domestic violence is rarely screened for during prenatal exams. They, you know, listen to the baby's heartbeat, ask you how you're doing, and they will ask that safe question. But if the mom is scared or don't want to say anything, she's not. So um, this it goes undetected that they're, you know, being abused. Um, most of the women are under 20, and when they're they don't when they are in domestic violence. Um, situations they don't go out and get their prenatal care, which again leads to prenatal to um, low birth weight, um, infant mortality. We as African American has the highest infant mortality rate. We want to leave you with understanding that there is life after. Yeah, there is life after. Okay. Um, and I don't expect that, I said it yesterday at Great Abyssinia, I don't expect that when you are released and delivered that you're going to do like I did, jump out of airplanes, go white water rafting, and doing all the kinds of things that I always wanted to do once I got free. 
but you will have life because you have been given life. God said, Christ's word, I think y'all word, folks, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It doesn't say that every day. You're just enduring life. You're to enjoy life, and that's what it's really all about. Enjoying life, learning who you are, and learning that you have a right to be loved and to be loved the right way.